Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This video is the first in a two-part companion to my 2015 paper with Percy Leung called Bringing Machine Learning and Compositional Semantics Together. The goal of this lecture is to review the concepts from linguistic semantics and machine learning that are crucial to the area of natural language understanding that is typically called semantic parsing. The follow-up video to this one presents a basic framework for defining and pursuing research questions in this area. Before moving on, I want to quickly mention that reference implementations for all the models discussed here are available from this link. I think the code is a good way to begin getting hands-on experience with these models. Let's begin by reviewing the core concepts from linguistics that we'll depend on throughout the lecture. Broadly speaking, we view linguistic objects as four tuples, consisting of an utterance U, its syntactic structure T, a semantic representation for that structure R, and finally the denotation D, which is the interpretation of the semantic representation R. For this lecture, we can think of utterances as strings. This is a simplification. Utterances are actually complicated real-world events, but the simple view is fairly appropriate for working with corpus texts. Our syntactic structures will be linguistic trees capturing constituent structure. Semantic representations are often called logical forms. That term is appropriate for the grammars we'll work with here, but it's probably too restrictive for theories based not in logic, but rather in distributed or vector representations. For the connection between semantic representations and denotations or meanings, it makes sense to invoke the notion of a program being executed to produce a value, or a database query being submitted to get back a database entity. In more cognitive and linguistic applications, denotations might be mental representations. We have the luxury of being fairly open about how precisely they are thought of. As in the associated paper for this lecture, I'm going to tell the whole story using basic mathematical expressions like 2 plus 2 and negative 7 plus 6. This makes the examples easy to think about in terms of both form and meaning. And despite its simplicity, the domain actually highlights many of the core challenges of natural language semantics. This slide depicts a sort of ideal grammar for these mathematical expressions. It's not comprehensive, of course, but it is reliable in terms of giving the meanings we would expect in the way that we would expect. The left column gives the syntax as a context-free grammar, or CFG. As we'll see in a second, this grammar can be thought of as creating tree representations, where the symbol on the left in each rule is the mother node for the daughter symbol or symbols on the right. So, for example, this first rule licenses simple trees that look like this. Uh, this first combinatoric rule licenses trees that look like this, and even allows us to continue with another application, and another, and so forth. The middle column gives the semantic representations, or logical forms, LFs. Again, you can think of these as little programs that we execute. They're given in a format that will be familiar to people who program in Lisp or its offshoots. The slightly unusual look of them is a reminder that they are abstract forms, different from the syntactic structures we build with the context-free grammar. Finally, the right column gives the denotations, or the meanings. For the numbers, this amounts to just a font change, but I wrote out the relations somewhat pedantically as a reminder that these are meanings. It's probably best to think of these denotations as numbers or mathematical relations in the abstract sense to distinguish them from logical forms. Finally, we can make a distinction in this grammar. The rules above this black line I'm drawing essentially constitute the lexicon for the grammar. And the grammar finishes with these two lines, which provide the combinatoric principles. And those are mirrored in the syntax, the logical forms, and finally in the denotations. I'll give you a better sense for how these pieces relate to each other in a moment. Let me mention two additional points. The raised square brackets give us the translation from the syntax to semantic representations, and these double brackets interpret or execute the semantic representations to get denotations. So again, focusing on the two combinatoric principles that we have, we can see that we're mapping from syntax, we then use the translation to get the logical form, 
And finally, we use the double brackets to go from logical forms to the denotations. Here are a few examples of the objects that the grammar produces. I've left out the syntactic structure, though. Here's a fuller picture. The utterance can be read off the leaves of the tree. The tree gives the full syntactic structure. It is translated into this semantic representation. And this representation is interpreted as the number two. And of course, each one of the constituents of the, rep the logical form representation has a corresponding meaning over here in the denotations. To save space, I'm going to write the syntactic structure and logical form together like this, where the syntax is given on the left and the semantic representation is given on the right after the colon. Uh, our theory keeps the syntax and the logical forms tightly coupled, so this is easy to do. There are theories of semantics that allow the two structures to be very different, uh, but we won't explore those ideas here. If you're interested, I'd recommend Irena Heim and Angelica Kratzer's textbook, Semantics in Generative Grammar. This is a slightly more complex example involving the same notational conventions. The utterance is minus three plus one, uh, and here it's been parsed with minus three as a constituent forming the left argument to the main connective plus. And the logical form is interpreted over here on the right in a structure that mirrors the one on the left. You might have perceived an ambiguity in the previous example. This slide illustrates how we handle ambiguity. Here I assume that we have a function called gen that maps utterances to their potential syntactic structures. This is a one-to-many mapping because of ambiguity. There are two ways to parse the string 2 minus 2 times 2, as the trees indicate. The top tree parses 2 minus 2 as a unit, the first argument to the main connective times, whereas the bottom tree parses 2 as the left argument alone, and the main connective is minus. The ambiguity is meaningful in the sense that the first denotes 0 in the end, and the second denotes minus two. The running math example is simple, but I think we needn't feel guilty as linguists about using it. As you just saw, it highlights ambiguity, and the ambiguity is one that is directly analogous to ambiguities that we find in full natural language, as you can see in these parallel trees. On the right, the top tree parses intelligent linguists as a unit, and so says nothing about the intelligence of engineers. Whereas the bottom one lets intelligent scope over the entire conjunction. Our grammar also has a single lexical ambiguity with two senses of minus. The first corresponds to a binary connective and the second to a unary connective. Natural languages are of course rife with ambiguities like this. Here are just a few. We come now to one of the guiding ideas of this lecture, the principle of compositionality. The principle says, the meaning of a phrase is a function of the meanings of its immediate syntactic constituents and the way they are combined. For instance, the meaning of this entire tree is negative two. That meaning is derived from the, meaning, the meanings of its immediate constituent parts in a way that's paralleled on the denotation side and in the logical forms. Those meanings are in turn derived from the meanings of those parts, and so forth until we reach the lexicon where the meanings are presumed to be irreducible. We just look them up. One can also take the opposite perspective. We begin with the lexical items, and the grammar rules take care of the rest, fully determining the meanings of the complex phrases they are part of, until the root node is reached and the entire meaning is obtained. This quotation from our article begins to get at the synthesis between compositional semantics and machine learning that we're after. It begins, The claim of compositionality is that being a semantic interpreter for a language L amounts to mastering the syntax of L, the lexical meanings of L, and the modes of semantic combination for L. So once this much is learned, one has the capacity to understand novel combinations and syntactic configurations. So this principle gives us an understanding of how we manage to be creative with language, routinely producing and understanding sentences that have never been uttered before. 
And the quotation continues, this also suggests the outlines of a learning task. That is, how do people learn to be compositional interpreters? Or perhaps more to the point, given our goals for this course, what would it take for an artificial agent or system to learn to be a compositional interpreter so that it too could be creative with language? Let's begin to make this learning task more precise. Here's the grammar we've been working with. What would it mean to learn it? Well, we can take a number of different perspectives. The goal of parsing is to learn how to map from strings to syntactic structures. So that neglects the semantic aspects of the problem given by logical forms and denotations. What's normally called semantic parsing is the task of going from utterances as strings or from syntactic structures to logical forms, which are another kind of syntactic object. The denotations then take care of themselves. We execute the logical form to obtain them. In general, the learning task here is one that trains on pairs of utterances and their logical forms with the goal of learning how to generalize from the training data so as to accurately construct logical forms for new examples. Finally, what I'll call the interpretive task seeks to, in one way or another, learn all aspects of this grammar. In practice, the challenge is that one is given utterances or syntactic structures and their associated denotations. And the system has to learn to accurately construct logical forms in a way that reliably produces the desired denotations for new examples. These three tasks are just one dimension by which we can divide up the learning task. We might, of course, try to learn the entire grammar from nothing. However, it's not clear how that could possibly happen. It is, at any rate, too much of a blank slate for us to begin with now. So alternatively, we could assume that we begin with the rules of combination known. There are just two of them, so we can write them down. And we assume also that we're given only very rough information about the lexical items. And the goal is to narrow down or refine that rough information. And one can even make the task somewhat easier by assuming that we already know how to interpret the atomic number words in this case, and the task is to learn the relation symbols and how they are used. And of course, we could explore lots of variations on these themes, trying to balance being ambitious about what we are able to learn with practical considerations like what our available data will allow us to learn.